Okay, so today's class, we are going to talk about sequential circuits. We'll take up a few definitions. Uh, the mode that is being done is in more in a review mode. So, you had some exposure to sequential circuits before in your digital electronics. So, here we will try to review some of the definitions, some of the classification, and then from take from there and talk about implementation in the next class. As opposed to combinational circuits, the way we define sequential circuits is output is a function of not only the present input, but also past inputs. So, that is a fundamental difference in the way we look at define the sequential circuits as opposed to the combinational circuits, where the present output is only a function of the present input. It does not depend upon the past inputs. Today's discussion is primarily going to be ori oriented towards synchronous sequential circuits. So, when we talk in terms of time, so we discretize time. In synchronous sequential circuits, the discretization is with a uniform time period and this time period is given by the clock. So, we essentially look at inputs, outputs and so on. This circuit primarily in terms of discrete time and this time is sort of sampled with this clock input and clock is also an input to the system and that defines it is a periodic input and this defines the discretization. A very important component of synchronous sequential circuits is what is called the state of the machine and it is very important and state captures and we will see that how it happens. The state captures the relevant history of inputs in a compact form. That is a key word over here. It is of course defined very informally in terms of relevant history. Of course, if you talk of history of inputs, one way you can talk of history of inputs is you can store all the inputs. But the digital systems, once they are alive, that is once the power is switched on to the system and if you are going to store the whole all inputs, then over a period of time, you would have to store increasingly larger and larger amount of inputs. So, that is not possible. And so, what this state does is it captures what is required from the history. So, it extracts what is required from the history and we will see that how it does it and then it stores that in a compact form. We will take up some examples for doing that. So, here just to differentiate between how much of history needs to be stored. Of course, we have two things over here. So, here the memory is being used only in the context of inputs, not in terms of the memory of the system, because later on we will see that all finite state machines only require finite amount of memory. But the output, the present output, let us say, depends only on a fixed number of past inputs. We have to only consider the previous two inputs or previous three inputs. When we say two, three, four, we are talking of discretization that we have performed with the clock. We are talking of samples that input samples that were taken with the previous clock, the previous to previous and so on, the preceding clocks. If our present output is a function only of some fixed number of previous inputs, then we call that as a finite memory system. We will see an example of it, a pattern recognition system where we are trying to get a pattern like we did an iterative circuit for it, trying to get a pattern like 1101. So, it only depends upon the present input and the three previous inputs, because if the pattern is to match or not can be decided by just looking at four inputs, the present input and the three previous inputs. So, such systems are called finite memory systems. On the other hand, let us consider a sequential circuit which generates parity. Okay. So, now we are talking of sequential circuits. So, vis a vis previously we talked of iterative combinational circuits. Here the inputs are arriving with in time. So, not all inputs are available at a given time instant, but the inputs are available at sequentially they are arriving. And I gen want to generate a parity. So, basically looking at the previous inputs, I want to say that number of ones that have been received are even or odd. If I have to consider the inputs, I cannot just consider the previous three inputs or previous four inputs. I have to consider all the previous inputs to be able to generate an output. And such systems are called infinite memory systems. It does not mean that they require infinite amount of memory to it, but basically they require a history, the past history, the inputs that are required if you have to generate an output, it requires 
basically all the inputs are responsible for the present output. So, this is a classific one type of a classification that is done in for uh, sequential circuits. Of course, both of it as we will see are could imp can be implemented with finite state machines and we will see that as we go ahead and talk of the examples. Now, let us look at the representation. A synchronous sequential circuit like this is a phi tuple. A machine M is a phi tuple. There are three sets over here, input set, output set, state space or state set and then there are two functions. Let us look at what each of them mean. Inputs, when you say an input set, it is a symbol set of inputs that you can receive or set of symbols that you can receive. These character set that input character set could be encoded in some form, it could be encoded in as 1 bit, 2 bit, 3 bit depending upon what is the cardinality of this set. So, that is let us say you are talking of inputs being characters then ASCII could be an input set. So, ASCII is an encoding of the characters. If they are let us say BCD is an input then you uh, 0 to 9 1 digit decimal digit is an input then you can have a BCD representation as a set of input. So, this is a 4 bit input. You can have a 1 bit input, 2 bit input or any number of bits. So, that is an input set. Output then again you have some outputs coming. It could be a 1 bit output, 2 bit output or it could also be a set of characters that you want to output and it could again be encoded in some form. State is a state space. So, this is the set of states which the machine can be and we will see that how do we define that states. Then we have defined two functions f and g. f is a function which does the mapping. What the mapping it does is from takes for every member of the input set and every member of the state set it defines an output. So, it is a mapping from the space i cross s to o. So, for a member of the input set and for a member of the state set it defines the output. If it is completely specified function then for every member of input and every member of the state for a, a state set you will have an output specified. If it is incompletely specified for some combinations of i cross s some members of input set and state set it may not be specified. So, a completely specified function essentially will define for every member of this. G is a function mapping. What G does is it takes a member of the input set and a member of the state and defines a member of the state. So, it goes from i cross s to s. So, so if you consider a machine M which is a synchronous sequential machine. So, I have an input set defined, an output set defined, a state set defined and then f and g 2 functions defined. If I have this phi tuple then I have a complete specification of my a specification of my machine. Let us look at it from the point of view of let us take the two examples that we are already familiar with which we discussed in the context of iterative circuits and try to define a state machine for them. So, here we have a parity generator example. The parity generator example remember again let me restate the problem. The problem was I have a set of bits and I have to find out whether the number of ones are even or odd. If the number of ones are odd my output is 1 and if a number of ones are even my output is 0. When we talked of the iterative circuit we assumed that all these inputs are available x0 to xn minus 1 and n bit input are available simultaneously concurrently in time. In case of sequential circuit design what I am assuming is a bit is available with every clock. So, I am discretizing with clock. So, I have so every clock period I will get a fresh input and my output is to depend upon all inputs which are received from time 0 to time t. So, if I really need to store my inputs, it is an infinite memory machine. I need to store all the inputs that have been received from time 0 to t because I cannot even drop one of them because otherwise my result may be wrong because I what I am really required to find out is number of ones is even or odd. But fortunately, I need to 
store, I don't have to store all the inputs, I only need to store the past history, that is all the inputs that have been received from time 0 to t can be compressed into just two states. What I really need to store is only the fact whether the number of ones that have been received till now is even or odd. No, storing this information, I can generate the output. Even in the next state, when I go to the next clock, what I really need to see is, okay, what is the number of ones received till now, whether it was even or odd, I can look at that and look at the present input and generate my output. So, the number of states are finite here. There are only two states, S0 and S1 that is required. Though the number of inputs that it actually, so what we are do doing is, of course, I cannot generate some other information. If I want to generate some other information about the inputs, I cannot do that, but I can generate this particular output that I am required to do. So, the relevant history is captured by the state S0 and S1. The only history that is relevant to us is number of ones that have been received are even or odd. So, now let us look at the representation of the state machine. Typically, a state machine is drawn in terms of a graph. It has some nodes. The nodes correspond to the states and edges correspond to the transition. So, I define, so I have two states over here S0 and S1 and what I need to define is the transitions from these states to. So, now if I am in state S0, that means number of ones received till now is E1. And if I get a 0, the number of ones will remain even and so for a 0 input, my output will be 0. So, this is called a state diagram. So, what I am drawing now is a state diagram and in this state diagram, this is a set of inputs that are received. So, in this case, there is only a 1 bit input. And this is also a 1 bit output. If there of course, is a multi bit input, there is a multi bit output, I can specify that. And this slash separates the inputs from the outputs. But when I am in state S0, this is not the only input that I can receive. I can also receive another input. The other input that I can receive is 1. And if number of 1s till now were even and I get an input of 1, my output now the number of ones have become odd, so my output will be 1. So, these are the two transitions that I have specified at state S0. And remember, what is my input, what is my input set? My input set is E, I is 0, 1, output set is also 0, 1 and my state set S is S0, S1. So, now I have specified for this member of S0 and 0, I have done a mapping to this member. So, that is a function that implicitly I am specifying the function f over here. I am also specifying the function g because I am saying S0 to 0. So, the part of the function f over here is S0, 0, 0 will take you to S0. This is function g, S0, 0 will take you to 0 output. So, this is a member of the output and this is part of the functions that I am specifying. Now, when I am in state S1, I have to specify again the transitions. The two transitions, if let us say number of ones were odd till now, if I get a 0, I will, number of ones will remain odd because I got a 0 as an input and I will remain 0 and I got a 1 over here. And if I get the input 1, then my output is going to be 0 because number of 1s were odd till now and once I get a 1, the number of 1s will become even. So, this is a complete state diagram and it is completely specified. The reason it is completely specified is for each state, I have exhausted all the inputs all possible inputs. For state S0, there are only two possible inputs, 0 and 1. And for each one of them, I have specified the transitions. Similarly, for state S1, there are only two possible inputs, 0 and 1, and I have specified the transitions in each case. So, there is a complete specification of a parity generator circuit and what it does is it receives sequentially, it receives one bit at a time and generates an output. 
So once I arrive at such a state diagram, we will talk about how do we implement it, but let us look at an another example of uh, the other example I take is also something that we have discussed already and this is the pattern recognition example. I am again looking for over overlapping patterns and what I want is now it, now it is in terms of time. So, the uh, specification is going to be let me yt can be 1 or 0, yt is 1 if xt xt minus 1 xt minus 2 is equal to 1 1 0 1 0 otherwise. <coughs> if you compare it with what we did before, previously we said x i x i minus 1 x i minus 2 x i minus 3. There we have assumed that all the x i's the vector x i was available simultaneously. Here I am assuming that they are arriving discretized by time. So, when I say t minus 1, the implicit in this assumption is the clock. So, t minus 1 corresponds to the previous clock, input received in the previous clock, x t minus 2 is the previous to previous clock and so on and so forth. x t is the current input. I do exactly the same as I did before. So, I am looking for this pattern and I say that I have four states. S 0, no match till time t. S1 1 bit match till time t, S2 2 bit match till time t and S3 3 bit match till time t. I define these four states very similar to the way I defined it before for iterative circuits. And now once I have this, I can easily convert it into a state diagram. Let me look at the state diagram. So, S0 no match till time t. So, the first bit that I am required is a 0 is a 1. So, if I receive a 0, I will continue to be here with an output of 0. But if I receive a 1, my I will go to this S1 state, but my output is still 0. Now, if I receive a 0, I will go to S2 because I got a pattern 1, then I got a pattern 0, so 2 bits are matched. If I receive a 1, then 1, 1 will keep me in this state because I could consider this one then recently received 1 to be the starting of the pattern. Now, if I have 2 bits are matched, if I get a 1, I will go to state S3. If I receive a 0, so what I have received now till now is 1, 0, 0. So, I will basically, it does not match. So, I have to go back to this. Now, 1, 0, 1 has come. If I receive a 1, that means now the pattern has matched and I will output a 1 and I would have got a pattern 1, 1, 0, 1. So, I will go back to S1. The reason I will go back to S1 is I can also consider this one to be the starting of the next pattern, one bit match that has occurred. If I receive a 0, so that means I received 1, 0, 1, 0. So, I can actually consider this to be a 2 bit match and I can go to So, now I have a state machine drawn and this is a part of course, which you have to do let us say uh, by analysis of your problem from the input specification. The input specification could have been a specification of this nature or it could have been an English language statement from which you have actually arrived and you can say that please look for a pattern which is 1101. And once you have specified that, then you write down this informally in this way. Net. And then from that, by doing an overlap analysis, because what you have to really do is 
I am looking at 1, 1, 0, 1 and what had happened if I am in this state, if I am in this state and so on and so forth. I had to do overlap with the pattern that has already been received and I had to make a transition to the proper state and once I do that, I have the state diagram. Later we will see that once such a state diagram is drawn, the implementation is a fairly mechanical process. Translating this into a circuit is something which can be done by following an algorithm either manually or in a programmed machine which can realize the circuit which can be used for implementing this. But whenever you draw such a state diagram, one has to make sure of one thing that if it is a completely specified, like in this case it is completely specified, all the transitions should be specified. That means given any state, all the input symbol set should be exhausted. The input symbol set of course in this case is only 0 and 1, so there should be two edges, two transitions originating from any state. Of course there could be transitions which can actually absorb both the input sets. There may be a situation where you do not care whether the input is 0 or 1 and you are still going to next transition, but that does not mean it is incompletely specified. It only means that both the transitions are merged, the two specified for the two input sets you are making the same transition. So once you have ensuring that, that all the transitions are specified, it is completely specified finite state machine. Now let us look at this particular state machine vis-a-vis -vis what had happened in the previous case. In the previous case, when we are doing iterative circuit design combination circuit, we can look at it as spatial iteration. I was iterating that making copies of this circuit, it is the same circuit, number of copies of them and I was doing it sort of spatially because I am repeating them and so I have a circuit which can perform a combinational circuit which can evaluate, so which is whether, whether it is a parity generator or whether it is a pattern recognizer, I have identical cells and copies of them and I can repeat that. Whereas a state machine in this case is doing the same thing but is doing in time. Even the design of the cell is no different because we followed more or less the same strategy for designing the cell in the previous case and designing the cell in this. So what is important over here, so I have my input, I have my output and this is, this cell is same as this cell. Of course, I also have inputs and outputs. So what is the difference? These inputs of course are arriving together, these inputs are arriving sequentially. The other difference is this particular component. This particular component is what we call as state register. This component. <coughs> this part of the circuit is a combinational circuit exactly like the combinational circuit we had. So what does, so the state register plays the key role of, so what is happening is this input and remember the two functions that are getting implemented as part of this combinational circuit, the two functions that are getting implemented are f and g. The role of f function is taking a state, so this is a state and this is called the present state. This input is called the present state. So it's uh, so this f is nothing but remember f was mapping i cross s to o. So it's taking a member of i and member of set s. The present state is one member of this set s, and is generating a particular output. But I also are imp I am also implementing the function g which is nothing but i cross s to s and that is done through the next state. So I am taking a member of the input set and I am taking a member of the pres state set and I am generating two outputs, i cross s is input to this and i cross s is input to this for both these f and g functions and I am generating a member of the output set and I am generating a member of the next state set and this I call it the next state. Now, 
what is the role of this particular component? The state register plays a very important role and this is that this is the component which actually does the discretization in time because what happens is I have this shown as a clock. So, this is my clock. And clock proceeds, so of course, in this ideal case, I consider clock to be periodic impulses. Of course, in a real implementation, we do not have impulses, but here we can consider them to be periodic impulses. And the role of this clock is to actually make the next state to be the present state. Once this clock comes, I transfer this value across this. And the present next state, be, uh, the, whatever is the next state now will become the present state because I have advanced by one clock. So, t will go to t plus 1 each time I get a clock and this will happen recursively. So, t will get to t plus 1, the present t that is t plus 1 will go to t plus 2 and so on. And this, at this time, this next state becomes the present state and I have to define the next. From this present state, I have to define the next state again. So, that is the part that is done by this particular state register of handling this discrete time and this also functionally plays a very important role in state machine because what happens is as far as the combination circuit is concerned, you cannot really control the delay in case of a real implementation. Of course, here one can assume that there is a zero delay, but in a real circuit as many of you have already done measurements in the lab and others will be doing that. So, there is actually a delay involved between the inputs and the outputs. And these delays are a function of many things. They are also, it is not just that you can say that output will come 20 nanoseconds after input. It is not like that. It is also depends upon the values. Sometime it may be 20 nanoseconds, sometimes it may be 30 nanoseconds, sometime it may be 45 nanoseconds. There is a certain range out at which, after which the output will come and it actually depends upon the values. So, how do I talk in terms of t, t minus 1, t minus 2? Basically using this clock because this clock corresponds to now the maximum delay that can occur in the combinational circuit. And my clock period will define this discretization of t, t plus 1 or uh, t, t plus 1, t plus 2 and so on in terms of this maximum clock period. So, I will choose a period which is larger than the maximum delay that can occur in the circuit and in that case it really does not matter when it comes when the next state comes over here because I am not really concerned about it. My input is the present state and this will come at a periodic interval that is defined by the clock period. And this is the role that is played by the state register and which is an important component. Now, we will talk about two different ways in which sequential circuits are implemented. <coughs> One is called the Milli machine, the other is called the Moore machine. So, I have a milli machine. Basically, till now whatever we have talked of is a milli machine. So, I have both this function f and g implemented here. This is my input which could be a vector, output which could again be a vector. This is my present state and this is my next state. All of them are vectors and this is my clock and this is my state register. So, if I now look at it, so what is it? This function takes a member of I cross S, one element of input, one element of state to one element of the output set. That is the function. If I express it in terms of time, so it what it relates is it relates O T output at time t as a function of input at time t and state at time t and that is the function that is. And this is, please remember this is a combinational circuit. So, all sequential circuits rely extensively on design of combinational circuits. This particular time because there is, you can see that this is a time t. Okay. Now, if you consider the other function which is generation of the next state. So, of course, I am staying here as t plus 1, but of course, this t plus 1 part is taken care of by this. So, I basically have to generate, I can write it as instead of s t, I can write this as o t f i t 
and present state. And I can, once I do this, I can ignore this T because it is just a combinational circuit of input, present state and output. It is relating that and it is all relating at the same time. So, in this case, I can again define this next state to be a function G of input and present state, again ignoring the fact that the time comes into the picture. As I said, the time part is taken care of by the state register, which will make this next state to be the present state after a delay, which corresponds to the clock cycle. So, both these functions f and g, which are combinational circuits, they are implemented as part of output function and the next state function. This is f is called the output function, g is called the next state function and I have my state register, which stores this information regarding the state. So, I can reduce this problem of a sequential circuit design to a problem of designing this combinational circuit and using a state register and we will see the type of the state register. So, once I have this relationship and these relationships are easy to extract from the diagrams that we drew. What is the relationship in terms of inputs and outputs? I know that for each of the state and each of the inputs. So, I will have basically a truth table and this truth table on the left hand side of the truth table for the inputs I have the states and the inputs. On the right hand side I have for the function f I have the output and for the next state function g I have this next state and those can be written down in terms of the truth table from this state diagram without any problem. There is a variation of this and in some problems we use what is called a Moore machine. Of course, theoretically a Moore machine can also be looked on as a subset of the Milli machine, we will see that, but one try, likes to distinguish it for uh, some reasons of design, because the design can be simpler if we differentiate between these two. So, in this case I have two functions again similarly, but in this case what happens is the present output is not a function of the present input. Of course, the sequential machine the present output is a function only of the past inputs. So, if you have a situation where the present output is only a function of the past inputs, whereas the next state is a function of both the present input and the present state. So, then we can write a Milli machine. In case of a, a Moore machine, in case of a Moore machine, the function f takes a member of the state say, set s to an output set. So, it is not S, I cross S as before, but it is a, just an S to O. So, our T is going to be a function of S T, that is the present state. The next state vector, so, that's, so this is your I, this is your O, this is your present state, this is your next state, this is your clock, this is your state register. Exactly as before except that I have split this function. So, this is a function g and this is my function f. I have split this function. Of course, you can say that even in the previous case, I can say that this function can be written so that it is independent of some of the variables, input variable and so you can say that Moore is also a special type of a Milli machine. But as I said before, we like to distinguish between them because the way the design is done can be, this fact can be used to simplify the design when you are doing a Moore machine design. So, if you have this particular situation, so you have this input and present state defining the next state, but it is only the present state which defines the output. The present state is not a, output is not a function, present output is not a function of, but both these f and g are also combinational circuits, because from this again I can remove, so this O is a function f or only of the present state and next state is a function of i and present state, sorry, g. And so, both these functions f and g are again combinational circuits, which implement the, and this does the exactly the same role as before. It transforms the next state to the present state with a very clock tick, and there is no difference between them. But if you look at the state machine that is used to draw this, it will look a little different. 
if I have a state machine for a Moore machine, I can have let us say state S0, I can have state S1, let us say for some 0 input okay, and for some 1 input I go to state S2, I am drawing some arbitrary state machine. Here instead of associating the output with the transitions, I will associate the outputs with the states. I can say output is 1 here, output is 0 here, output is 1 here and so on. Again I have to draw the other edges that are coming from here. So in this case, I am going to associate the outputs with the states rather than with the transitions because as we will see over here, the output is only a function of the present state output is not a function of the present input. Of course, it is a sequential machine and inputs are going to influence the next state and that is how it is going to influence the output, but there is a time lag between the inputs and the outputs. The present inputs are only going to influence the outputs that are going to come after the next clock. And so that part will get reflected over here and you can draw this Moore machine in this manner. There is a method of drawing there is a method of transforming this Mealy to Moore, we will talk about that later, but for the present, you, if you see a state diagram like this or if you recognize a machine to be a Moore machine, you should draw your state diagram in this manner by associating the outputs here. Otherwise, if you want to do a Mealy machine, then you associate the outputs with the transitions and not with the <coughs> states. Okay. Now, we know that we have seen that uh, F and G both whether it is, is it's a Moore machine or whether it is a Mealy machine, in both cases F and G are combinational circuits and we know how to design a combinational circuit. Once we know the truth table, I can design a combinational circuit. Issue is how do I design my state register because that is an important part of the system. So, that is the other component, one is a combinational circuit, another is a state register and state register depends upon what is called the state encoding. The size of the state register depends upon what is called the state encoding. I have a set of states. In the case of the, in the, case of the parity generator, I had two states S0 and S1. In case of the pattern recognition circuit, I had four states S0, S1, S2, S3. Issue is how do I represent this in terms of a binary pattern. After all, finally, any digital implementation, you have to think in terms of binary representation. All information, whether it is characters, states, inputs, outputs, all of them are finally encoded in terms of bit patterns. So, I have to choose the number of bits that are required to encode these states and here I am considering four different possibilities of doing this encoding. Consider a machine with n states. Let us say I am talking of, I know how, what is the value of n, this is the number of states I have in my state diagram and say k bits are required to encode it. I choose, now of course, I can, what is the range of values of k, this is what I am going to talk about over here. I can use what is called one hot encoding. One hot encoding essentially refers to the fact that each of the encoding that you do only one bit is one. So that means if I have my state S0, S1, S2, S3, I can map this to 0, 0, 0, 0001, I can map this to 0, 0, 0010, 0, I can map this to 0, 0100, 0, 0, I can map this to 1000. 0, 0, 0. So this is an example of a one hot encoding. So, I have 4 states and I have 4 bits, n is 4 and k is also 4. Only one of the bits is 1. The advantage of doing this is later on when we will see this, there is certain advantage of doing this. Finding out whether a machine is in a state or not, let us say by just looking at this particular bit, I can decide whether the machine is in state S0 or not. I only have to look at one bit to decide whether a machine is in a particular state or not. Of course, by looking at this bit, I will not know which state the machine is in, but I can looking at it, I can know that whether it is in state S0 or not. Similarly, 
whether a machine in state S1 or not, I just need to look at this particular bit. And this type of an encoding is called one hot encoding. There is a price you pay, the price you pay is in terms of the larger number of bits that are required to encode, but there is also a certain advantage you get and sometimes that advantage overweighs this. So, you use, uh, sometimes one uses one hot encoding for doing it. From this, there is also a two hot encoding. A two hot encoding refers to the fact that you, at, to represent any state, there are only two bits which are one and not more than two bits are one. Two and only two bits are one to represent any state. So, that means, for example, in this case, I can represent this as to be 0, 0, 1, 1. Of course, there are other combinations in this case possible. The number of combinations that are possible we know is if you have k bits is kc2 because you are choosing 2 out of k bits to be 1. That the k should be the relationship should be such that because I have to be able to represent n states, some other combinations may not be used here because this you cannot always make them equal. So, the number of k bits should be such that kc2 is greater than equal to n. That is the relationship that needs to be satisfied to be able to do a two hot encoding. Again, the advantage in this case is that decoding a state, you only have to look at two bits to decide whether the machine is in a state or not and sometimes you use. Very often one uses what is called minimal encoding. A minimal encoding refers to the fact that you want to use minimal number of bits. The number of bits that you want to use is, you cannot use less than this number of bits to represent a machine with n states and that is nothing but log 2 n ceiling. So, if you have 4 bit states, then you require at least 2 input, uh, 2 bits to encode them. If you have 5, then you require at least 3 bits to encode them. In a very other, any other general encoding scenario, actually sometimes you encode with a combination of them. Later on, we will see that there are machines which are product machines. You have 2 state machines and finally, the machine that you are designing is the product of these 2 states. So, in that case, one may be doing one hot encoding, the other may be represented as minimal encoding. So, you can do a combination of them. So, but whatever you do, any other encoding scheme you use, you will be limited by the fact that the number of bits that you use will be between log 2 n and n. You have to use minimum of log 2 n and you will use maximum of n to represent in case of any other encoding. Okay, so so, this we later on we will see that it also has an influence on the circuit that we design. So, let me just recapitulate what we have discussed today. What we have talked about is we define what a state machine, sequ sequential state machine is. We defined a finite state machine. We saw classification of them as finite memory and infinite memory. We looked at two examples and these examples are exactly what we did as before as combinational circuit design. We talked of the differences between the Mealy model and the Moore model of the state machine. And then we also talked about the options that you have in terms of encoding. Once you have a state set, how can you encode in various number of bits? Okay. Thanks. <laughs>